Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and Chief Evangelist for Postman, Kim Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore the world of APIs through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Gregor Hopi, Enterprise Architect at Amazon Web Services. Gregor's work with enterprise infrastructure has been the foundational reading for the last 20 years. And I find his pragmatic view of architecture and how we deal with change very refreshing. Let's uh, let's start with the basics. Who are you? What do you do? Oh, what do I do? Um, I'm during the day. I'm an enterprise strategist. That means yeah, I meet with with AWS customers, you know, discussing the cloud migration. But I do a lot more things. So I write books around cloud strategy, and my favorite topic is the role of architects and architecture and all the stuff that we do. I've been following your work for a long time. Uh, I feel like your books are required reading if you're coming from the SOA world. But if you're even if you're brand new to the API world, um, I feel like they're timeless. And I definitely recommend the, the enterprise integration patterns. It's a pretty fundamental bedrock stuff that, that I think folks should tune into. So what, what do you spend your days working on? So interestingly, you know, the enterprise integration patterns, that's sort of the classic. We wrote this in 2002, so that is 20 years, and then it was published in, in 2003. So I actually spend a reasonable amount of my time recently re-implementing some of the examples in the book on top of serverless platforms. So basically, same design idea, so what enterprise integration patterns did, if we sort of teleport ourselves 20 years back, right? It was EAI, maybe sort of early SOA days. So people started building sort of distributed, integrated solutions, but it was all very fragmented by different vendors. So what we did is define a common vocabulary that helps people design better messaging asynchronous systems. Now, what I did then starting last year is pick that back up. So I have 20 years of technology evolution to take advantage of, but I found that we're still making you know, similar design trade-offs and using those design patterns is still really a good way about going about building serverless systems. I like it. The, for me, there's a lot of fundamentals in there and it helps me to reread something because I read it back in the day and then reread it in, in today's times because it, it kind of triggers a bunch of emotions and thoughts about how we got here, what's different from from then to now. How would you see things? I know you like to see things in terms of constraints as far as like what 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 limits us and what what defines how and what we can build. But what what's different from then versus now uh, when it comes to API infrastructure and architecture? Mm -hmm. Very good question. And as I, I said, I like to think about the role of architects and architecture. So when I consider what we're doing, I always see us sort of coming, coming from two directions, from, from two angles. You know, the top angle is really you have a certain intent, right? You're trying to do something and accomplish something. And that's where the design patterns really give you a better language to express your intent, right? Like, People might say like, oh, I put a certain component here, name, name your favorite product, right? That doesn't really reveal what you were trying to do very much, right? That is your choice of service or product. So what the patterns from the top down try to do is they give you language to say, oh, I was building a message filter, meaning, right, a series of messages goes in and then based on a condition, some messages are passed through and others are taken out. Right now you could say, aha, you know, the reason I use this thing, if it's, you know, step functions or event bridge or any other of your favorite, right? This can be you know, any ESB kind of product. Now you can say why you're using this and what you're trying to accomplish. And I think that has remained as relevant as ever 20 years later. The bottom half, that is, well, what products do I have at my hands? And you said the keyword, so now what constraints am I operating? Under, right? We often think we have a blank slate when we do software design, but the slate isn't quite as blank, right? Because we don't want to build everything from scratch. 
Uh, we want to use product or services that are already there, an open source project. So we have some Lego blocks, some building blocks that we're starting with. And those blocks come with some constraints, right? And that's where in the last 20 years, things have changed enormously. So when we wrote enterprise integration patterns, right, in order to build any kind of sample application, we had to install software <laughs> to know and you know, run things locally. And one of the most tedious parts was in order to make a little code snippet like this to say, like, this is what a message filter should look like is like, ideally, like five lines of code, right? Get a message. We apply the predicate. If it's true, send the message. If not, don't send, right? If you want to be very simple about it. So those you know, five lines of code needed like 100 lines of scaffolding, right? This was all the stuff like getting set up, you know, message receivers and senders and you know, Java, JVM settings, and all the other things around it. So the signal to noise ratio was relatively poor at the time. And that has changed a lot, right? So the constraint of you know, having to install software and, you know, being dependent on sort of the operating system that you're running on your laptop or PC, that has pretty much gone away with the serverless solutions, right? It all runs in the cloud. You can go to any kind of cloud shell that you have and basically do everything without ever installing a single thing. And the signal to noise ratio has improved enormously, right? You can use your know, serverless event routers and you can literally put your event filter in there and you end up, yeah, you know, maybe not exactly with five lines, but maybe you end up with nine or 10 or 11 lines. So, the way we build these kind of solutions has become a lot more expressive because it shows the intent and it gets rid of all the noise. Well, these these constraints have gone away, like me having to set up my, you know, some of the physical ones. I used to have to actually rack mount servers and, and do a lot of that. Those things have gone away. I don't have to install as much software, but as these things are fading away, there's new ones being emerging, right? New types of constraints. I mean, serverless isn't free of constraints. It, it introduces some, some new concepts that we have to wrestle with, right? Some new trade-offs. Mm, yeah, and I think we've both been in the industry long enough to sort of see a little bit what, what the game we're really playing, right? We're, we always have to work within the constraints we have. Like, you know, if you can't get hardware, right? If you're wrecking and stacking and it takes you a month, you know, to get any hardware, you will make certain design decisions, right? You will put as much as you can on the one server that you did get. You will, you know, maintain that thing forever, right? You will make a lot of design decisions based on that. So removing some of these constraints, like, yeah, you know, I can get, you know, compute nodes or the you know, actual functional element, right? I'm no longer talking about VMs or containers. I'm now talking about an event bus, an orchestrator, a queue, uh, publish subscribe channel, right? I can actually get functional elements. That constraint, you know, goes away. What we do then was that the game that we tend to play is, so we have a new playground, right? We can do these things of like, hey, I can have functional components at any point in time in any form or shape and as many as I need. And I only pay for when I actually have traffic. What we do is we, we push that new approach to the limits because like, oh, this is fantastic. So I want more of it. And then we find new constraints. And sometimes we find constraints on the technical side, right? That we build systems so that ultimately don't work the way we would want to. Or we hit mental constraints so that we build something that we can no longer understand. And I see this cycle all the time. We sort of in a certain pocket because of technical constraints, we make this go away. Then we shift over here. Everything seems so much better, but then we sort of hit new kind of constraints until we remove those. And I think that cycle we've played quite a few times, at least since, since I've been in the field. Yeah, there's, I mean, I've been doing this since the eighties and then the nineties and the two thousands. There's, I've seen several cycles come and go. And I feel like that's helped me see through the change and, and, and uh, address change. Do you have any other recommendations? I mean, for teams, trying to understand and, and wrestle with change and deal with these these cycles? Is it just experience? You just have to be in the industry long enough? Or are there other ways we can help help our teams uh, deal with this? 
Mm. And this is sort of a very architect question, sort of for the slightly tongue in cheek definition of the architect, sort of being the wise person in the corner. Like, you know, tell us from the many attempts that you had and did you learn anything? So I, I think in this case, it's a mix of, it's good to be excited about the new technology, right? As I said, like the 20 years, it's just day and night, right? From implementing the same patterns, right? So we should be very excited and thankful about the modern platforms we have, right? Like, you know, things like, you know, serverless cloud, you know, microservices architectures, you know, event-driven things, streaming, AI. I mean, all this stuff is just amazing. At the same time, sort of, you need to have an alter ego, if you wish, which takes a very rational view to it. And the way I always think about it when something new comes along, I like to ask the most simple but most profound questions, right? The one is, which problem does this really make go away or reduce? Which problems you know, stay? And then what new problems does it perhaps introduce, right? And I think it's very good to have a balanced view, you know, what falls into this category. Let's take you know, microservices, right? Sort of very, very common thing, right? Well, it makes some problems go away. It makes the problem of software inventory go away. The like, you know, I have, you know, nine new modules that work and one that doesn't, but I need to ship a single binary. So, you know, I can't do that. So it makes that problem go away. It also makes the problem of independent scaling largely go away. Right. I have a big application. Some stuff is pretty benign. Some stuff is really heavy. Right. Before that led to, you know, very poor hardware utilization. So I can separate those pieces scale out the piece that's very heavy and you know, sort of leave the other stuff alone. Um, what it doesn't make go away is us having to deal with you know, modularity, for example. I need to structure my thinking and my solution. You know, a lot of the microservices discussion has now shifted to domain-driven design, right? Because having a good design and modularity for your application, that is as much needed as before. And then if you look at new problems that it introduces, it's like, well, I have more moving parts. Right? I have more complex runtime behavior, right? Sort of, you know, I have then things like circuit breakers where partial failures sort of propagate through my system. So there is more things at the runtime that I need to deal with. And I think going through this exercise in your head leads to two really important um, results. The, the one is, you know, it gives you a much more balance, a much more, let's say, architecture kind of mindset. It's like, yeah, some things are good, and here's some things I need to watch out for. But it also lets you think about, can I achieve similar results with other approaches, right? It, it sort of detaches you a little bit from the buzzword. So let's take the software inventory. Well, if I have a really, really good CI, CD system, Right. And I have really modular software. So may it still be a monolith, but I have really good control over my builds and tests. Well, I can probably reduce my software inventory even with a monolith, right? Because you know, I have feature flags and other things. The one that isn't ready just doesn't go in. The other ones do. I build, I deploy and off I go. So it really helps us to not latch on to these buzzwords and say, Oh, everything must be microservices for some reason or another it allows us to see the trade-offs that, that we're making. And I think that is really key to the architect mindset, like shifting some problems, we just shift from left to right. We make different trade-offs, but we should see those clearly. So, so help me, I like that. So help me, help me apply that to serverless, because that's one area I would say that's, that's in the same realm for me. I'm trying to understand and explain what the business value is, why my, 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 I, my leadership should be uh, investing more in serverless. So how do, how do walk me through how serverless uh, applies to all this? Mm. So, so serverless is, a, is an interesting one because you know, similar to the microservices, it reveals itself at different layers, right? Like microservices started as sort of, hey, I make my application into smaller pieces, but then you realize that in the end, it, it leads to a different way of actually building software. And I think, Serverless takes that to a whole other, other level. So the first important common probably is, yeah, I just compared serverless to sort of microservices, right? I come from a very application topology and application structure perspective, because I think that helps us really understand. Too many people 
you know, see serverless as sort of, oh, it's VMs, it's containers, and it's serverless. And I think that's too narrow a view. That's just the compute runtime, right, for one component, which the whole point of serverless is you can have many small components. So the interesting thing about serverless is that you have many interconnected small components, right? And that's where it really moves the needle. Now, that's the architecture point of view. How do you translate that into why should my business care, right? I call this the architect elevator, right? My other book I wrote, writing the architect elevator, you have exciting stuff in the engine room. Well, how do you translate that into something that your, your boardroom, your penthouse should be, should be interested in? And that's why I think the economic aspects of serverless play an enormous role. And they come in a, in a couple of flavors, right? The one flavor is, we already mentioned, like essentially no setup cost. Right. The thing is just like you need one, you have one. Right. You have full automation. So no developers are spending, you know, days and weeks, you know, patching and configuring and installing stuff. Right. That's obviously really good economics. And those economics play out especially well if you run experiments. Right. If you want to build something, you know, small and quick, not having the setup cost, you know, can, you know, bring your overall effort down maybe by, by two thirds or even 90%, depending what, what you're trying to do. The next part that's exciting to the, to the, to the penthouse is you have very different economics. So if we are honest about normal application delivery, the run cost of an application is kind of a black box, right? You have like 10 VMs and the thing runs on there and the 10 VMs cost you pretty much the same amount of money every month. So you have no insight into your marginal cost. So let's say you have an app that serves like 100,000 users. Well, how much does one user cost you? Like how much does signing up one more user cost you? The real answer is you have absolutely no idea. I was talking to an airline, right? And we know like last two years have been super tough business for airlines. So they have a management system for all the aircraft, right? Where's the aircraft maintenance, all that kind of stuff, as you would imagine. And basically, because to the, due to the pandemic, they went from 100 aircraft down to three aircraft. Well, now you can guess what happened to the cost per aircraft. Well, the cost per aircraft increased exactly 33 times because the cost was all fixed. So that means they have absolutely no way of managing their IT infrastructure by unit costs. Like they have no idea how much does one extra aircraft cost me? Like they don't know. It seems to cost nothing until maybe you have 150 aircraft and then a huge system upgrade comes and somehow strangely the, the 50th extra aircraft now cost a million dollars because system and hardware upgrades. You cannot really manage IT like that. So serverless makes all that go away and you can now start to discuss your IT cost by function. So how much does it cost me to manage one aircraft? How much does it cost me to sign up a new customer, right? Is that profitable, right? Is it meaningful for me to reduce the cost of signing up a customer or should I rather reduce the cost of you know, doing the shopping cart or closing a transaction or whatever function or business you might be in? And that completely changes the way you look at your software and the, the cost benefit ratio between those. Is this an effective way for me to look at my legacy infrastructure? I mean, is, is, does it give me the technical and the business toolkit I need to, to tackle my, my legacy systems? Mm, so legacy is an interesting word. Like there's anything that was done before yesterday. <laughs> so it tends to be, tends to be legacy, right? So, um, I worked in Silicon Valley for a long time and people always said, Oh, you can do everything you want because you have no legacy. Right. And I said, no, 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 this works differently. We're moving faster, so our legacy also arrives more quickly, right? We had we had legacy problems all the time, but we 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 did something about it. So legacy, you know, there isn't a magic button you can push because the very definition of legacy is generally something that's hard to change, right? If you have an old system that's easy to maintain and easy to change, most people wouldn't call that legacy. They're like, oh, it's just a system that's been really good. It's been around for a long time. So by definition. You know, changing something, getting something into a modern setup that is currently legacy is, is going to be difficult. I think what we're learning there is a couple of things. The lack of transparency is probably sort of the worst part of 
you know, of legacy. Like you don't know what you're dealing with and you have no safety net. It's sort of like walking the high wire in the dark, right? You can't see what you're doing. And when you fall, it's gonna be very, very painful. So what a lot of people do is, is a couple things. You know, a, a lot of folks first just re-platform, sort of like the lift and shift that generally isn't our favorite word, right? Because you sort of get the same old thing in new packaging, but it allows you to get a little bit more transparency. How does this thing behave at runtime? You know, I can get some better monitoring observability around it. So I can turn one light bulb on at least by shifting this thing to a different platform, right? And, you know, sometimes these are, you know, emulator simulators that run old COBOL things on a Linux box. And they seem like a kludge and they are, but at least they get you, like I said, they turn one small light bulb on so you have some idea. And then on top of that, people use incremental approaches. So boiling the ocean doesn't tend to work very well with legacy systems. So people take one module, maybe even sort of a read-only module, something that calculates something. When I was in insurance, so calculating quotes was always a good example, right? It's used a lot because people want to know how much is it going to cost me to buy my car insurance. So it's used a lot and it's kind of sort of stateless, mostly stateless, right? So it's a read-only calculation. So people take one small piece out of that. And then you can run the systems in parallel. You can see if they, they behave um, similarly. And then you can repeat this. And serverless is a great target for these things because let's take the quotation. Well, now, A, I know how much a quotation costs me, right? So I can decide, let's say an aggregator, the yeah, insurance aggregator, like somebody comparison portal, right? I want to get insurance, you know, please everybody tell me how much it costs. I can decide whether it's worth responding or not, right? Because if hardly anybody ever signs up, maybe the quotes just cost me more money than it's worth. So I can make a intelligent decision. And in many countries, you know, car insurance is a very cyclical business. Many countries have like annual cycles for it. So, you know, I have a traffic spike and it's very quiet the rest of the year. So I don't pay anything if it's the rest of the year. So we have some very nice stories where it can be done. It does require some grit, though, I always tell people, right? It's not going to happen overnight. Yeah, serverless is interesting in how it's, uh, I would say it's helping us address uh, in a little more structured way, it feels like, uh, than microservices. Microservices definitely felt like it was a much, it's it's a much more wild west. Um, but microservices have a little bit more, more, uh, set of constraints or, or logical constraints to it that help us think through this. But you mentioned uh, monitoring and observability there. I feel like, w would you say, is is that the differentiation between an important one of legacy? So anything created yesterday is legacy now. But if we have that observability and monitoring and that un understanding of how it works, is that going to shift? What, what legacy means in the future? Like if everything moving forward from here has, has monitoring and observability and into it and traceability, is that going to change what, how legacy impacts us and, and in, in the future? Mm, I, I think so. And for, for, for a couple of reasons. So one thing that can really help us sort of make legacy less bad is having things run on a common platform, right? Like, what you really don't want is the legacy that runs on some piece of hardware that nobody makes anymore and there are no more spare parts. And if that thing ever breaks, there's just like nothing you can do. So lifting things on, you know, whether it's, it's the cloud or your on premises, whatever you choose, like lifting it on a common baseline underneath that evolves and is maintained, you know, takes a lot of the pain out. So even though one system might be old and built very differently from the other one, there is some common layer. Under, underneath, right? And in the past, if you were lucky, that common layer was IP networking, right? But now I think we can, you know, we can have a lot more things in the common layer, right? Is it on a standard VM, right? That is patched. Does it have common monitoring and observability, right? Can I see what the respective systems are doing? I think those items can, can really help us, help us a lot. Where, where I want Folks, though, as I said in the beginning, right, sort of the, the problems that go away, the problems that stay, and the new problems that come is with the new systems, yeah, in order for them to not become a yeah, legacy, you need to realize that as you're making smaller runtime pieces, right, we're basically decomposing our application that started with microservices and then 
we took it to the next level with serverless or functions as a service, right? I can now deploy individual functions. So we make finer grain solutions and not just at design time, we've been doing this a long time, right? At design time, we make classes and methods, very fine grained things. Now we have fine grained things at runtime. And as I said, it makes many great things, you know, scalability, elasticity of the solutions, cost effectiveness, etc. But I have more moving parts. So my runtime now gets its own complexity, right? And this is now the territory of sort of queuing theory and back pressure and loop loops where you know things sort of basically escalate into a, 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 a small problem, escalates itself into a large problem. And this is exactly where monitoring and observability are the best compensating element, right? Because we shift some of the complexity into the runtime for good reasons, because it gives us capabilities that we, we like. Stuff scales and is efficient and you know, fail safe, etc. But we need to deal with the new problems that it introduces, and that is we have much more complex runtime behavior. So in that sense, I agree that if you build a solution like this and you don't consider monitoring and overall systems management, you probably build tomorrow's legacy, very much so. So if you have the transparency and the manageability of your solution, I believe you're going to be much better off. Yeah, the I feel like this new world, the, the microservices and then the push in the serverless, when you're focused on an individual function or service, uh, I feel like I have more control over what's happening. And when I have my blinders on and I'm working at that kind of atomic modular level, uh, I, I get this. The cognitive load is, is much lighter here than it was with the monolith. But as soon as I pick my head up and look across everything and think of, you know, and go up the elevator, as you would say, a little bit, um, I, I've, I'm not sure that I have as much control um, than I used to, that maybe, you know, DevOps is getting me um, a certain level of control. But how would you say my that control or lack of control shapes our world when it comes to how we build systems? Mm. So, so I think you can have the same level of control, but you need to make a conscious, conscious effort. So what, you know, since you know, we talked about enterprise integration patterns and what has happened in, in 20 years, one thing that hasn't changed as much in 20 years is that when people build integrated solutions, they always think about the pieces, right? Well, I have these two pieces and I just need to connect them, right? That's how it always starts, right? So you very much focus on the pieces and the connection is sort of like, yeah, well, obviously I sort of need a connection to make this thing work, but, ah, you know, it's just a line, right? I have two big boxes and this little line and I think that's good. Well, we learned 20 years ago and we learned this time and again, as your system becomes more decomposed, the lines are becoming much more important. So I tend to give a talk at conferences where I show two very simple diagrams. It's like the boxes A, B, C, D, you have four components, and there's two systems that have exactly the same components. But they're wired together very differently. One is sort of a, a stack, like a layered A talks to B, talks to C, talks to D, and the other one is basically fully connected. And the two systems have completely the opposite properties. Right on the left side, very clean architecture. I can replace one module very easily, but you know, long latencies and maybe a you know, single point of failure. Right? If A can only talk to B to C to D, if C goes out, nobody can talk to D anymore. The other system, which is fully interconnected, has almost exactly the opposite properties. It's very resilient. If one path goes down, everything else still still works. Right? It has shorter latencies, but Maintainability is poorer because if I want to, you know, take C out, now I need to redo all the connections to A, B, and D, right? And this is a great example. I think the lesson we need to learn time and again is the lines are as important as the boxes, right? The system topology is of equal concern as the boxes are. And it's so much easier, like you said, put the blinders on a little bit, right? Say, oh, I just want to work in my one component. It's such a tendency, we need to actively counter steer that. The, the overall system behavior is, is equally important to the behavior of the small system, uh, the small component, and it should get the same attention and tooling, right? Like testing, right? I test my components, yeah, you know, traditionally. So I test each component, I wire them together, you know what happens? Nothing works, right? That's the classic we always have, right? Like it's the same thing I say, like you have a, a complex system, 
every server, the light is green, all servers are running, but the system is not working, right? That's how it always ends up. The problems end up between the pieces. So what I'm a big fan of is getting the tooling for the overall system to the same level of tooling and discipline that you would use for a, a single component. And you know, coming back to the, the observability and monitoring, that is one key part of it. And I think the second key part of it is automation, right? Like the cloud you know, isn't just sort of another server. You know, the cloud is about, it's programmable, right? I can get my resource now via API. And that's where I spend most of my time when I'm working on serverless solution is, can I make it so that I code the components in my favorite programming language for co coding the components? But can I code the application topology, like how things are wired together? Can I also code that? And the answer is yes, like with CDK, right, which we have from AWS, and there's sort of a Hashi version, like a Terraform version of CDK, right? I can do that. I can code my application topology. And now both layers we talked about, the boxes and the lines, they both have a programming representation. I can start doing unit testing. I can do refactoring. I can do a lot of cool things. And that's to me most exciting because now finally the two layers get the equal attention and the equal tooling that they deserve. And that I think is easily underestimated how big that shift is. Yeah, that's going to give us a lot more control over the future and the direction that we go because we're not just at the we're not, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a much higher level thinking and we're actually able to see the landscape rather than just, we seem to get our blinders on and get stuck at the lower level. So how do you, how do you ride the elevator? So how do you maintain your, your architecture level, your high level view and, and ride the elevator to the top floors, but then also stay relevant by going down to the uh, lower floors? Cause I know that's a common challenge for architects is you like staying up 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 here up high how do you how do you understand what's going on on the ground floor and and and, and keep your skills relevant yeah the, the the view on the food is always better in the penthouse right so some people don't feel the need to to go back down but you know the elevator goes up and down right i always say riding it once up that does not count so for me personally i think a couple of things uh, are required the one is you gotta have a natural curiosity you just gotta be interested in yeah, what's going on in the engine room. So when I started building the, the loan broker, that was the example from enterprise integration patterns. I'm just like, hey, I should just, you know, try this in serverless. We have all these cool tools, right? I've never used them as much. So just curious, like what's, what's going to happen, right? I think that's number, number one. You got to have the urge to sort of be connected to, to reality. The good news is, and that comes back to our serverless topic in the past, Trying something out in the engine room was super difficult. I remember when, when I worked as chief architect before, if ever I wanted to do anything hands-on, I would pair with somebody else. And that had some good reason. And the good reason was I like pair programming. It's a great way of knowledge transfer. But it also had a pragmatic reason. Getting a development environment set up for any of our systems would have taken more time than I even had, right? It would take three days to even write one line of code for me because all the setup. Now that serverless may go away, right? You can like sort of download some sample, you know, some sample CDK script, like run that. Well, here's your system. I'll make a change, deploy that. Well, so basically the time to learning, right? What you want to do is make a change, see what happens, learn from that, make another change. So the time it takes until you get into that mode has gone from like days and days to like maybe minutes or at, at worst case, case hours, right? So that's the really, really good news. The, the third part, right? So you get the curiosity, you get, you know, take advantage of the new tech, makes your life easier. The third part is, there's so much debate about should architects code? And I generally say yes, but for a different reason than a coder codes. And I think that's important. So the architect doesn't code to become the best coder, right? Then you should be a developer, right? I think that's fairly obvious. The architect should code so they can understand the trade-offs and constraints better, right? All the stuff we just talked about. So when do you, when you do your coding exercise, your goal isn't, you know, to write better code than the person in the cubicle next to you who does that for a living, but to come back with new insight, right? Like things we just said is like, ah, 
you know, the serverless thing is great, but too many moving parts, right? It's easy to forget the system image, the topology. So basically, when I do anything serverless, I want CDK, for example, right? Because I got to be able to program my components, to program my topology, and that's the way it should be. So architects have a different objective when they code, right? It's not about, you know, learning, you know, the latest sort of library that you might have or, you know, squeezing the last bit or CPU cycle out of something. For us, it's taking insight back that we can then use on, on other projects and really learn more about the, the system structure and how we build good systems. What's the, what's the best way for a developer, say, you know, with varying levels of experience, but start understanding how to program at the, the topology level and, and, and kind of poking around and get curious when they may not have a lot of experience? What's the best way for them to, to learn at that level? Mm -hmm. So people learn different ways, right? I like learning by really building something from, from scratch. I remember like a couple of years ago, when Kelsey Hightower wrote a book, it was like Kubernetes, the hard way. And a lot of people say like, why do you take me through all the details that Kubernetes essentially makes go away, right? Why do I need to know all this stuff? Well, his answer was very easy. He's like, well, so you actually understand what the thing does, right? Don't just take the magic for granted, right? Start with the pieces like, here's how you set up a cluster from scratch. And once you understand this, you can get to use all the magic. I, I like that approach very much. So from, it works for me, at least. You know, I didn't use, when I started with the serverless, I didn't use any of the sort of magic templates as much. I'm like, let me just build this from scratch. Can I get a, you know, sort of step functions, talk to an SQS queue, and can I have a Lambda consume that? And like, you know, little struggles here and there, right? See how this goes and then learn, learn from that. So that worked well for me. Like really make baby steps and give yourself a, I would say almost like a controlled experiment environment. Build something relatively small and, you know, play around, you know, change some dials, you know, put a queue, then take the queue out, put something else, see how that behaves. Um, what that does, it overcomes sort of the natural tendency. Experienced engineers that I know when I had like really great time, long time ago, I got to play a program with Ward Cunningham and he was working on a PIC chip, like tiny eight pin little microcontroller. And he intentionally had bought like the cheapest, least capable version that he could find. Like this thing, I think like 32 bytes of RAM or something ridiculous, right? It couldn't do anything. But what you find is the really experienced you know, architects, they find a lot of richness in the simple thing. Like he was like finding all these nuances and he was sort of trying CICD. He was debugging with a TV because the thing had no useful output, but it could output patterns. So he could show the patterns on a, on a CRT screen because he could emulate you know, the TV signal. And you might say, oh, isn't that just sort of geekery? Is this actually useful? And the answer is it's not, right? So the experienced architects and engineers, they find so much richness in a relatively simple setup that they can learn a lot from that that they can use later. The novice engineers, they always chase bigger and bigger and more complicated things. It's like, oh, we need microservices, we need this and we need that. And in the end, they don't really understand what they built. So my advice there is build something small, build something that looks simple, but understand the ways in which it's actually not simple. I'd right? like find the odd behaviors, find the dynamics, see how this thing behaves. And that is your real learning. Because then as you move up to more complex systems, you will understand how it works or sometimes it doesn't work. And then you actually have a chance to, to go fix it. Versus if you use the magic, Right. If the magic show sort of ends, like <laughs> basically, there's nothing you can do. That's back to the constraints, right? We're we're under we're you we're using constraints to really understand the space that that we're operating in or existing in, and and pushing the boundaries, as you said earlier, and so that we truly understand what's possible, what's not possible, and that just really uh, helps us truly, I think. Get to yep. the details, the technical details of what's happening. And it, it, it knows, it, it teaches you sort of where the boundaries are, sort of the, 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 the image that comes in my mind. You know, sometimes we see very sort of simple animals and they just run and then they hit the glass pane. 
right? Mm-hmm. Because they can't see as a glass and they like keep doing this and you're like, oh, that thing isn't very smart. Well, if I look around the development area, I see a lot of the same thing, right? If people are like, oh, I have this new toy. It's amazing. I'm going to run with it. And it looks really good until you hit the glass pane, right? And you're like, oh, ouch, that didn't work. Oh, well, what was that? Well, let me try again. Oh, ouch, right? And <laughs> that just doesn't go anywhere. So what the, the, the style of you know, development and architecting I described, right, where you understand the, you know, the, the mechanics, the nuances, it keeps you from running into the, into the glass wall. You're like, ah, here's the sweet spot of this thing. This is, works, works well. Ah, but here it works a little bit less well. You start to understand sort of what the terrain looks like. So versus, you know, the, the novice that's like, oh, this is like paradise. Everything is great until it, boom, right? It hits you. So versus we like, ah, it's a little steep over here. Maybe, you know, I stay off. Maybe over there is okay. And being able, like you said, the constraints, the trade-off, basically being, knowing your terrain, understanding your terrain and being able to maneuver on the terrain. I think that totally changes the way you, you build systems. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a really healthy state of existence uh or relationship with the world around you and te- especially in technology that can be pretty expansive i mean digital landscape is 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 can be pretty vast and endless and so really working hard to make sense of it is is important so uh, how, how do you stay so curious and interested in what you do all the time you've been doing this a while now how do you what are you working on that keeps you so interested and so curious Mm. So there's two dangers in the architect elevator, right? So the one danger is people who never go down, right? And, you know, they just become sort of buzzword, you know, folks, you know, I wouldn't call them architects, so that is not, not useful. But then the other danger is exactly the opposite. Once you go down into the engine room, you will find so many exciting things, like you, you never want to leave, right? Because like you said, like the tech universe, well, it's A, very exciting, and B, it's very big. And C, it's probably also reasonably complex, right? So all the good ingredients for a person to, to, to get lost. So what, what I tend to do is, is A, as I said, right, I pick what looks like a simple problem and build it from, from scratch, right? So I, I try to stay close to the metal, right? Like really build things up. So when, for example, when I built the loan broker, the very beginning, it didn't have automation even. I did anything on the, everything on the command line, just very, very simple. And then I, I ratcheted my way up saying, okay, well, that obviously isn't a good way of doing it. So I tried like CloudFormation, I tried SAM, and then yeah, I tried um, CDK and like, oh, that's like, that's the thing I want, right? So, so I made um, small baby steps. The, the other thing that probably helped me, I had a specific goal in mind. It wasn't like, well, I need to learn serverless stuff. Right. That would have been, well, that can lead to two results. Either it's really boring and you don't learn anything or it's really exciting and you never come back. Right. So my goal wasn't to, to learn serverless. Right. My goal was, well, implement this loan broker example from enterprise integration patterns, build that in a modern, modern architecture. So I had my, my goal, my, my scope and what I wanted out from my engine room, what I wanted to bring back. I had that defined. Now, Did it still get like five times bigger than I thought when I went in? Yes, of course it did. I I blocked on my enterprise integration patterns side and it's like five massive blog posts and I didn't even write down all the pieces. And I think in the end it's like 20,000 words. Like it could have been like a small book almost. So you got to understand there's a multiplier factor, but you have a certain scope and have something you want to bring back, like a learning for you as an architect. And I think that puts yeah, a helpful boundary box around your engine room adventures. I like that. So are we gonna are we gonna get an updated version with with all your recent experiments at some point in the future? Ah, so you mean the updated version for the book? Yeah. So there's the um, there's a couple of things there. So the the website, right, is enterpriseintegrationpatterns.com. Actually, what I did is um, I up I published modern examples, right? I started this a couple of years ago and you know, whether this is Kafka, Kafka, whether this is the different cloud providers, I just said, hey, there's new implementation examples. So what we found is that the patterns itself and the pattern language hold very well. I always said like some of the design guidance and overall you know, considerations 
this expressing intent, right? like a message filter, a content filter, an aggregator, like all these things still exist and they're still useful. So the only thing we would need to swap out is the mapping to the implementations. So what we're doing there right now is, is rather than update the book, just have this online. It's like so much easier. So people can buy the book and get sort of the design intent, the trade-offs. And then if you say, like, hey, here's what this looks like in serverless, right? Then you just get that, get that from, from the website. What do you do when you're not at the computer and you're not being an architect? What, what, what keeps you interested and curious? Mm. So I think there's always you got to balance sort of the left and the right brain. So when I'm when I'm not architecting, I'm usually out and about. Well, I used to do a lot of winter sports, right? But I live in Asia, so that required international travel. So so that's taken a little bit of a hit. But yeah, I like the outdoors, right? It gets fresh oxygen in your brain, and um, I think when you do that, the left side of the brain doesn't have to shut off completely. It can sort of run in the background. And this is where I come up with ideas like the famous article I once wrote is like, why Starbucks doesn't use two-phase commit, right? Those are the things if you detach from your tech stuff and you go off in the real world, but the tech stuff runs a tiny bit in the background mm -hmm. thread, you end up with stuff like thinking about two-phase commits when you're at Starbucks. Yeah, but most of my hobbies are actually sort of move the body, like get outdoors, cycle, like snowboard. Um, I think that that gives you a good balance. Yeah, no, agreed. It's and it's essential in these in this kind of COVID time. I think is to have a have a nice balance. And like you said, if you have lots of things to think about when you're out there, um, you know, you come back with a fresh view and and and, and hopefully an elevated perspective of what's happening. Correct. Um, that's, that's that's what I what keeps me going as well. So I, I said in the beginning, I have sort of a little bit of a double life or multiple jobs. And that really relates to seeing things from different levels, right? So there's the enterprise integration patterns and building serverless stuff in the engine room. But then I run the other side, architectelevator.com, right? And this is more about you're know, seeing things from a higher level. This is more like the, you know, the, the penthouse, the boardroom kind of perspective and the architecture. So what also helps me is having more than one tech persona, if you wish. So sometimes I'm deep in the engine room. Sometimes I'm still left brain tech stuff, right? But the architecture of thinking is already, it's not so totally left brain actually, right? It's like thinking about how to explain things better. Like you said, how do you explain this to your company leadership? So there's a lot of right brain actually that comes in. So I think having a tech persona at different floors of the elevator can also help you to not sort of get stuck in this, this one little thing. So when you're when you're at the higher levels, would you say more uh, of your work is having to make it speak to business, make the technical speak to business, or is it more simplifying and distilling down the tech into simpler terms that that leadership's going to understand? Mm. So, so I think it's 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 really the combination of of both. So the the biggest problem I see is that when we speak to the you know business users or higher level executives. We, we, we believe we're speaking to children, right? We want to make everything like super, super simple. I'm like, hold on. Yeah, you're speaking to the most you know, successful and accomplished people in your organization, right? So why do you assume they can't understand anything? And then people say, oh, but they're not technical. And I'm like, well, define technical, right? And then like, oh, they don't know what a helm chart is. And I'm like, well, that's not technical. That's like an arcane piece of technology stuff, right? They don't need to know. but they are very capable of understanding things that I call technical, like trade-off, like all the stuff we talked about, architectures, topologies, trade-offs, constraints, right? They understand really well because that's how they run a business, right? It's the same thing. So the key here is to build on the kind of thought patterns that executives tend to do very well, right? They know how to make decisions. They know trade-offs. They know risks. They know implications, right? They know boundaries, they know constraints, right? That's otherwise you wouldn't have a company. And then translate your engine room things into those mental models. So it's simplifying, simplifying is a tricky word, right? Because in this case, yes, it is simpler, but it's not dummified, right? It's not sort of made, oh, we should all be agile. Oh, we should all be on microservices, right? That's what I call dummifying. That's not simplifying. 
Simplifying is finding the right level of abstraction, right? Like the trade-offs we talked about, right? Like microservice and serverless, fantastic, but you're shifting more things to the runtime. So you need better runtime tooling, right? Those, I guarantee you, every business executive or every high-level executive will be able to understand that maybe with two or three more sentences than I just did now. But these are trade-offs and balances you can convey. So the key is finding higher level of abstractions, and they look simple at the surface, but they're not simplistic. They still allow you to reason about what you're dealing with. And I think that's the magic of the elevator. It's not about telling the people here one thing and telling the people here another thing. That doesn't work. Right, that's called what well, I would call it lying. If you want to be blunt, right? That's not riding the elevator, right? Riding the elevator is you're taking what is here and forming useful abstractions that allows people to understand the essence of the decisions we're making here, without having to know all the the details that the, the product details or the language details underneath. And that's what the elevator is about. And every time I do this, people are super happy because they're like, oh, finally, I can. I can understand this stuff, like no jargon, but actual thinking, right? You don't want to be hit with jargon like random stuff. You want to be hit with a mental model. And then I, we can together think in this mental model. They're like, ah, so, you know, should we move to this thing gradually? Is this, you know, the serverless or microservices better for some part of our estate? You know, should we use it everywhere? Sort of how do we get this into the organization? Right. Is this good for certain markets? Maybe we have volatile markets. Is that good there? Right. Suddenly you make them part of the thought process. And that's when you want, right? Like when you have your executives thinking through the problem with you, then that means the elevator has really worked. Yeah. I think I need to, I've been spending a lot of time at enterprise integration patterns.com. And I think I feel like I need to spend equal time or more at this point right now. Uh, at architectelevator.com because it, it really, I would say, this is where I'm at. I would say, at least for me, I'm really trying to learn to speak that language and 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 translate it. But I'm I want to be riding the elevator back up and down on a regular basis, but maybe for a different set of reasons than an architect would. And so I think, but I think the architect elevator is is a good place for me to start. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I hope you. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a it's a strong metaphor, and people really latch latch onto it. Especially as I said, it's about making the connection and going back up and down on occasion. So I think the metaphor is becoming quite sticky with software engineers who you know, tend to be frustrated, like, "Oh, the managers don't understand what I do, or they don't want to support my project, or I mean, whatever complaint they might have." Is you know, people really start to see, okay, at least half of the equation is on me. Right. And I need to understand how to bring things to the other levels. And they find the architect elevator there extremely helpful. Yes, definitely. Well, I, I appreciate your time today, Gregory. This has been really enlightening. Um, I, I definitely want to find some time. I could say, I would say I'd like to have you back and talk about a whole just session on just the architect elevator because I think there's a whole. A whole world there that 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 developers and 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 folks need to tune into and at least uh, think about. So I appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you for the for the great chat. Thanks again to Gregor for stopping by. For more on Gregor Hopi, you can visit enterpriseintegrationpatterns.com or architectelevator.com. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com/events. Flash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Kim Lang, and until next time, cheers. <laughs>